Poems to a Listener, Readings and Conversation with Contemporary Poets. In small numbers the birds are back, one by one new call notes. Then by twos the tanagers, bright as struck fire, return from their winter's arc. And others, suddenly visible flashes against still trees. Our bodies are like these birds. On a signal so clear they don't have to think, trusting to certain mute scatterings of stars, they just get here and strike a beginning. Welcome to Poems to a Listener. I'm Henry Lyman, and in this half-hour program, we'll be visiting with poet Margaret Gibson and listening to poems from Long Walks in the Afternoon, published by Louisiana State University Press. The passage we just heard, in which the birds are seen returning, suggests that ourselves, like the birds, possess an inward, almost instinctive sense of direction. When you're acting utterly spontaneously, you don't ask to think it out, you don't ask for reasons, you don't ask for a theory or for someone else to explain it to you. You just simply know what you're about and you do it. Is it to be almost like the birds? Yes. But there are plenty of things that get in the way of that. Yes. Um, so to say our bodies are like these birds is also a wish. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> if you can be factual and wishful at the same time. If we could, if we yeah. could. Yeah. Sometimes, maybe, sometimes. Mm -hmm. Subtle Wisdom When you shut the door in my face With no bird singing I go to the mountain The sky is more still On a bare branch I find the knife Whose blade is a thread stretched in the wind I walk the edge Until it flames to a furnace a wind so hot my gold rings whirl and melt. There's a tree in bloom at the center. I take a cutting, come back. Though it's dawn when I open the door, your silence is winter's. Stone walls pitch with its weight. Stars freeze there. I show you the flare from the almonds in the bowl on the table, their pale small flowers white hot. You hold your hands out to them. We look at each other an hour. Now ask me again what I want. The looking that seems to settle things and um, calm whatever has happened. After the storm of an argument um, or of a misunderstanding, there is the necessity for stillness and silence. Uh, one party shuts the door <laughs> in the face in of the other, and the other goes away. And the other goes away um, to a place where no birds sing, where there is great, great stillness and where there is a tree in bloom at the center, and she takes a cutting from this as a kind of um, amulet and brings it back. She's been to a very hot, still, glowing place so that even the almonds in the bowl have a kind of light around them. The almond flowers melt his silence, yeah, that wintry silence. That's right. He holds his hands out to them, and he warms his hands by them, and the wintry silence melts. And then there's the looking again. The let's other. get used to each other again. We've been through a storm. We've now in a still place. The moment has passed. Who are you? Who are you really? It would be good if we could settle things like that, just say, look. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I say, there's a lot more than just the looking. There's, it's what goes on, I think, in the interior spaces before the look that makes the difference. Learning a new language. 
When I tell you I've waked as if in a basement and the windows are open, I can smell roots. Don't do anything, you say. Just stand there. And simply, I am waiting. Even learning Spanish in the evenings, I'm waiting as if for a stump cut down years back to send up one sapling wet with new leaves. Or sometimes, looking around the room, I find you here on the sofa, head tipped back to music, learning what it means to open. Then each new word gives me your upturned face, la cara, the face. La ceja, eyebrow, la nariz, the nose, temple, la sien, la boca, the mouth. And I remember the darkness, how the sea climbs out of it, and the firmament, and light, tentative at first, a dawn full of wind, and words that let be. Words that let be. Um, the simplest words, words with lots of space around them. Um, very simple words, nouns, verbs, let there be stars, light. let there be light, let there be water. Um, or when in a certain mood you look at a face you know very well across the room. And if you happen to be studying your Spanish vocabulary at the same time and you start applying it to the very familiar face across the room, suddenly you're making up a stranger's face. Uh, the very well-known face becomes a new face. Um, fresh. Fresh. Um, so, that, so that words have little sunrises in them. <laughs> <laughs> but like but the very, very simplest. Like yeah. The very, yeah. very simplest words. Is that the kind of words that you're trying to incorporate in your poetry? Is that the kind of language that you would like poetry to to make itself out of? Well, yes. I, I do strive for a kind of clarity and simplicity. Um, I don't think that you give up uh, complexity of thought or of feeling um, or of relationship or, or of, of understanding the world by preferring simplicity of expression. For me, language that lets be is language that, um, well, doesn't impose. It, it just it brings things out. It brings objects out without um, telling us what they are necessarily. Are. That's right. And jargon is a tyranny, and polemical speech can be a tyranny. Yeah, well, today language is so fabricated. Yeah. By and words that let be... Um, to have the words that you use be true enough to what it is you're, you're giving in words so that the thing itself is really seen to be what it is, and it's just let alone. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's the ultimate freedom to let it be itself. Journey. Our train speeds north along the coast, careens along its ties and rails, I spill my coffee on your shirt. I like the taste of cotton and wet skin. Behind us and our reveries, by twos our counterparts, waking in fear of their bodies, smolder. Then the dining cars, and toward the rear, dark cribs of coal lie open to bright stars. Of course, one of us should go sailing out the window like a cosmonaut on a line and float in the updrafts, in the sparks of the wheels, and swoop out over the water. Are those islands or distant green Chinese pagodas? The word timbrel comes to mind, the ghost of a face on the glass. You answer as the train slows, look a station where the porter's hands are torn, his skin is cracked, his belly cold. There's blood in the street, women in the soup kitchen, empty kids, the rents unpaid, the grammar surly. 
we get off here, it will be better. This train journey, where is it? <laughs> some of the journey is, is, is the actual Amtrak speeding north along the coast, and some of the journey is something that's going on in the head of one of the passengers. Right, right, <laughs> a fantasy. You, so, you dream the islands off the coast. Right. Uh, you dream them into pagodas. Chinese pagodas. Yeah, there's all this movement and change of light and change of space, and you're really not in one place. But then everything shifts again. But things at the end. shift quite a bit at you the end. You end up in the station where the train stops, which is a, a, a poverty stricken place. Uh, uh, terrifying. And place. the decision is made to get out there, uh, not to follow the sound of the tinkling timbrel, not to try to find the distant green Chinese pagoda. Um, but to get off here. So it's here? Here, now, where there's blood in the street, where there's unhappiness, uh, where the language is, is surly yeah. and, and the needs are rough and raw, uh, because these are real parts of ourselves. Um, the distant green pagodas are there like little moments of light that give us glimmers, perhaps, of the possible, even even if the possible is outrageously and exotically far away. <laughs> Dreamable, anyway. Dreamable, anyway. Um, but the work is here. The work. And the work is with others. And that somehow the task is to make the dreamable and the distant intersect in a very real way um, with the here and now. Wars. A poem in four parts. Documentary. Men in stout uniforms, helmets like tortoise shells, glide on parquet, brush past a carved mantle, rococo and cool. Empires fall, a voice tells us, slowly. The rain falls, and in it blossoms of smoke profoundly cease fire. The narrator, if you could believe his voice, tells history as if it were a thing of the past. But his voice travels out into waves of dark galaxies light years away. The word war, grandly pronounced, wonderful as any sapphic poem or Persian shard. Isn't this the way history is taught? Yes, it is. And the particular teacher in this case was a documentary on World War I, which I was watching. And the narrator's voice uh, is made of mahogany and burgundy, and it's baritone, and it embraces war and blood and the fall of empires in such a grand way. And, you know, I watched this and I thought, what is this? This is not war. This is somebody's story about war. And this is how we get duped into thinking that it's really not that bad. An ordinary moment between wars. It's noon. The whistle blows in air like fetid fruit. The factories simmer. As I sit here wondering what to make of an English veteran I've remembered, brought to the theater in a basket, arms cut off to the collarbone, legs sheared to the crotch, compact, and speaking of Oscar Wilde, all art is useless. As I sit here, the workers from electric boat make their run through the company gates for liquor. You think of the workers running out briefly in the midday from the electric boat company. What? It's, it's a division of General Dynamics. It makes the Trident submarine. I don't have anything against the workers running out for a break. Um, no, it's the irony of it. It's the irony of it. But I do know that there are workers who are aware that they are working on instruments of destruction. They know what they do. They know what they are about. And the liquor is a way of distancing themselves from the reality of what they're doing. Civilians. 
When my uncle speaks of war, dignity buttons on him like a linen vest. Only the Germans were cruel. When he ridicules Asian peasants, his feet do a tap dance in their good leather and brown polished wingtips. I keep wanting to see them under a chest of bamboo in Da Nang, in a bedroom whose walls fly out in one blast, leaving the floor like a tea tray, one wrought iron railing in place, the chest, and those terrible, empty shoes. Dignity buttons on him like a vest. Uh, the gear of civilization, um, in this case, the polished uniform of the civilized man um, who has accepted his ideas from external sources and, and wears them in that way. Which, in a way, is a suit of armor, isn't it? Which is a suit of armor, yeah. right. Cold Wars Inside Asleep, I cross over rivers into a dream carried by pain in a gaunt man's face. He reads me ancient documents. Centuries crack. Old conquerors leave the left alive beseeching the moon, their hands cut off, flung at their feet like forgotten gloves. Now morning snow falls like sand in an hourglass close up. History is pain in movement, Burkhart said. It was his face in the dream. My feet touch the cold floor. I move into a day that opens like any other in history. Grand and numb. History is pain in movement. But it is movement. We're not necessarily stuck in the same rut that we'll never, ever, ever get out of. It may take a great deal of pain, physical or pain in consciousness, but we can get out of it. We can move beyond it. We can move through it and beyond it. So are you saying then that we are history today, now? Of course. Rather than... Of course. History is now. Um, you know, one something that I feel very, very strongly is that it is impossible to stand distance from history, which is pain and movement, and say, I am not a part of you. I point my finger at those bad people out there who have made wars or those bad people who make the children cold and hungry and the grammar surly and all the rest of it. The wars are inside of us, too. What makes history pain and movement is inside each one of us. And we start there, and we work on the inside, and we work on the outside. Stasis. Watching black water run, glancing up to the stars in these bold winter skies, I want only the optical illusion of movement. I will be pure, as pure as this fringe of ice forming in the shallows of the brook as concentrate as stone. I will stand here on the stone in the dark and watch the black water course over rocks and over the roots of the maple tree toppled in August, and I will not think. I will not hear cavalry officers' boots ring on cobblestones and not see you, Rosa Luxemburg, your cold body slung into a canal long before the war I was born in. I will say, and for one second believe, that the self is all we've got left. I touch wet stone, so cold my skin nearly sticks. I touch my tongue to the stone, Clear through to my bones, I want to feel passive as flint. Then strike. These fists fill tight with raw, 
unsinkable stars. You don't want to think, for this moment anyway. History is pain and movement, and this is the voice that says, I don't want to be in that movement if it's pain. I'll, I'll stay here, still, away from everything. Um, the illusion here is that the self is all we've got left. And for, for that moment, I'm going to wrap that little illusion around me, and I'm going to stay here. Almost believe it. You almost I'm almost going to believe it, but not quite. I want to feel passive as flint, but what does flint do? It strikes stone, and it makes a spark, and it makes fire. This is action. This is action. Uh, and you as a writer, um, you don't really see all art as useless, do you? I mean... Absolutely not. <laughs> obviously, because you're no. speaking to a reader, to a listener, um, trying to create a bond there. Um, I want the poetry to be the skin of my life, and as I've tried to indicate in many of the poems, it's, it's permeable. It's a very permeable boundary between myself and the rest of the world. And so when you say the illusion of saying the self is all I've got left, it's really quite an illusion because, I mean, to have a self is to have the potentiality of being connected with everything. So, so it's it, a return to connection. Not it's a, re a return uh, to connection. Not disconnecting. Yeah. Long walks in the afternoon. Last night, the first light frost. And now sycamore and sumac edge yellow and red in low sun and Indian afternoons. One after another, roads thicken with leaves, and the wind sweeps them fresh as the start of a year. A friend writes she is tired of being one on whom nothing is lost. But what choice is there? How can she close her eyes? I walk for hours, either with hands behind my back like a prisoner, neck craning up to the sky where chain gang birds in tight nets fly south, or with hands swinging free at my sides to the brook, the water so cold it stings going down. Either way, I whisper to dogwood, fern, stone walls, and the last mosquito honing in, we're in this together. Here is the road, honest dirt and stone. Some afternoon, heading home before dark, if I walk by mistake, lost in thought, far beyond the steep trees, the satellites and stars, up over the rim to a pitfall, past any memory of words. Even then, I can give my body its lead, still find my way back. I like the fact that you address the stone walls and the mosquitoes, saying, we're in this together. Side by side, going along with, not me over you, not the human race better than stone walls and mosquitoes, darn them, <laughs> and dogwood and fern and all the rest of it. It's, it's one tapestry that we all make together. We're all woven in together. Not separate, but together. I th when when uh, my stepson Joshua was eight years old, he looked at a, a, a stone and a, a, a glass jar and he said these are alive <sighs> and I said what do you mean they're alive they're not alive they're you're right they're alive <laughs> <laughs> they're they're alive in the sense that they uh, they live and they move and they have atoms and they animate our consciousness and they're they're part of what we're all going along with actually there's a continuous exchange of electrons going on all the time with everything around us uh, that's right and it gets back to what we talked about in the beginning about our bodies are like these birds. We have our migrations and our flights of fantasy and our, we have our various moods and choices. And we also have an awareness within us, an inner guidance system that keeps us here and aware of why we're here and who we're with. And that's important. Fire Elegy. 
In small numbers the birds are back. One by one, new call notes. Then by twos the tanagers, bright as struck fire, return from their winter's arc. And others, suddenly visible flashes against still trees. Our bodies are like these birds. On a signal so clear they don't have to think, trusting to certain mute scatterings of stars, they just get here and strike a beginning. These mornings my blood rings loud and I wake in time to hear five and six, seven, echo on the clock upstairs, and the birds, their cadenzas and solos. Then our outcries. In passion, the low vibrato I make when we strike the bell of our bodies deeply. All this music flung out of the body's loneliness. Just now, polishing a window, I drifted beyond the smooth and slippery loveliness of glass, beyond the soft cloth and lemon-sweet scent of the water, dreaming our bodies, polishing them clean as the spring air that skims these trees, as light as this whispering fire along a nerve, and knew the body's lullaby wished to be bounded and fed, joined to another's long journeying, a continuous keeping in touch. Why else, after long migrations, nights in the ice flows and winds offshore in the sound, after heights in the tropics when sun seems nearer than those oddly shaped pods, the islands below, why else, after breaking the spell of boundaries, do we return to each other, lulled by the rise and fall of our bodies coming together on fire? Thanks to the body, I learn my own call notes. I sing to the horizon, whose way is to move continually beyond our touching it, stopping or seeming to, only at odd intersections. Only last afternoon, I walk down the fire road that winds through these woods to a clearing of trees and a field, just as the sun swung its pendulum down the horizon. This season only, at this one moment each day, the red medallion struck on the crown of the road so that every stone flares, and the fire road true to its name, burns each branch and new nest, each thistle and weed, each crevice the frost made wide in the road, and the sticks of my body, arms and feet, all the bones kindle, and I burn with last light, unafraid, part of it. We've been visiting with poet Margaret Gibson and listening to poems from Long Walks in the Afternoon, published by Louisiana State University Press. I'm Henry Lyman. Thanks for being with us. Poems to a Listener was produced by WFCR, Amherst, Massachusetts, with technical assistance by Sheldon Katzman. Financial assistance was provided by the Massachusetts Council on the Arts and Humanities, the National Endowment for the Arts, and the Massachusetts Foundation for Humanities and Public Policy.